I'm Tejas Kumar, and I'm a developer relations consultant. What that means is I work with developer-oriented companies, companies in the past and present, including companies like Liveblocks, Crab Nebula, OpenSauce, Vercel, etc. Um, do their best DevRel work and reach developers effectively. To do that, I need to be in touch with the industry and kind of be up to date with some of the things we're talking about. And that's why we're doing this video today. Today, we're going to talk about React Server Components. It's going to be really exciting. We'll start from really first principles thinking about what even is React really? Um, how was React in its early days back when the development tooling wasn't as mature like today we just npx vite but in the past we had to write webpack configs and so on and i feel like server components is in that area where the tooling hasn't yet caught up but it stands to be a fundamental shift we'll explore um, the architecture of react including server components and how react was 10 years ago how it is today and how it might be tomorrow from there, we'll dive into React Server Components themselves, and we'll implement Server Components from scratch, from first principles. Uh, we'll follow the guide that Dan Abramov wrote on GitHub. There's a link to that under the like button. Um, once we identify that, we'll look at some, some more architecture diagrams of how data flows. Well, we'll look at them. I mean, we'll just examine them. We'll discuss them. We'll verbally look at them. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how they work in terms of data flow, and we'll ask the question, is Server Components for everybody? Finally, we'll talk about how you can increase your adoptability as it were of server components making sure you're in a good spot to make the shift if and when you choose and finally we'll highlight some community notes this is going to be a really fun session and i'm really excited about it but before we get started i want to emphasize that this video and this channel is separate to my consultancy work and is really just part of my willingness and joy and effort in spreading knowledge to developer communities and helping us do our best work and in keeping with that i'd like to thank the sponsor of this video that makes all this possible that sponsor is crabnebula.dev um, crab nebula is a great platform that deploys their mission is to make shipping distributing and um, packaging applications securely and instantly worldwide much like how vercel um, has this git push and then your website is instantly live everywhere um, crab nebula's platform aims to offer something similar where you get push and your native or mobile application is everywhere native desktop or mobile is everywhere instantly um, this is from the team that built the towery project and i'm very excited about the project um, so if you're interested as well i'd encourage you there's a link under the like button crabnebula.dev is who they are and what they're after with that Let's get into server components. Let's talk about server components. And I want to talk about it by asking you a question. What is React to you? Like when I say React, what comes to your mind? Um, it, it could be multiple things. A UI for building, uh, sorry, a library for building user interfaces, a framework for building, many things. In fact, in the previous video where we built a makeshift Next.js from scratch, if you missed that, I'll leave a link up there. Uh, we identified some of this terminology, library, framework, etc., and disambiguated a little bit. Um, the thing about React is it's multiple things. It is a library, but above and beyond library, it's an architecture as well. Um, and, and follow me a little bit, because React, when it started 10 years ago, um, you know, introduced JSX, and with JSX introduced a way of shipping and building user interfaces the formula view equals function of state and and really championing what was called the flux architecture of one-way data flow data starts at the top and kind of makes its way down um, in that way you can think of react as an architecture or a take on an architecture that is the flux architecture you can also think of react as an architecture in terms of the tooling that was in and around react at the time that wasn't widely used before react frankly um, we we did use gulp and grunt and things to bundle but we never really had to use transpilers mainstream. But with the advent of JSX, um, we, we ended up adding more tools to our chain. Those tools, um, of course, were not as well developed as they are today because they weren't as widely used. Um, and, you know, it required some assembly, some assembly required. I, I remember myself writing a few webpack configs by hand and learning the difference between things like Babel preset and Babel preset react, etc. I'm sure many of you have that um, also context. And if you if you do, let me know in the comments. But architecturally, there was a lot of stuff going on, a lot of tools that needed to be assembled the right way so you could do react. And this was one of the early criticisms. And to this day is some of the criticism, right? A lot of the view community says you can just include view from a CDN over a script tag, boom, you have a view app, you don't need any tooling. Um, so React does have architectural elements as well in terms of tooling. Um, however, over time, the tooling has matured so much that we forget it even exists today. I'm guilty of this myself. I'll create a basic client-side React app, and I'll do something like npx vite, uh, and it will just work. And that's amazing, but I, I often don't recognize it as amazing and just take it for granted, right? But the tooling has matured for 
client side and potentially server side React. Um, and this is important as we dive into server components. So React 10 years ago had, you know, NPM install, you'd have to do React, React down, but also Babel, Webpack, Webpack uh, plugin, Babel, Babel plugin, React, Babel preset, and we had to do all these things. And today it's NPM install React, NPX Vite, done. And tomorrow it might be NPM install React, React DOM next. And that's it. And next, the framework would handle this for you, right? Including adding TypeScript and things as you need. So um, that's where we're, we were, that's where we are, and that's where we're going. However, um, React Server Components introduces a whole new wave of tooling, next generation tooling that doesn't even exist in our session together. We're going to talk about why and how it does that and where we might be once the tooling catches up. But before we get into that, I want to quickly talk about what even is React Server Components or RSC. Um, and just like we've talked about what React is, it is indeed a library. React Server Components is multiple things. Um, some would say that it's basically re the React team's shipping suspense for data fetching, really. Um, I think it is that. It is also a way to execute, I mean, mechanistically. React Server Components is a way to execute components on the server and on the client, but specifically the server, and then send the output of those components to the client and let the client do its job. Okay. The benefit of this, of course, is um, smaller bundle sizes, better data fetching, etc. We'll get into that. Um, but it is that for sure. Above and beyond that, I think React Server Components, just like React, is an architecture. It is an architecture. It's it's a way of rendering and orchestrating applications and servers. So, and I do mean servers plural. We'll get into that. Such that your applications are performant and have better user experience. If we could write a long sentence about what React Server Components are, we would say... React Server Components is an architecture built on next generation tooling that is still experimental and not yet production ready, that requires rethinking React to go from client first to hybrid or server first, depending on who you ask, that includes the server at every level of the virtual DOM. So it's not currently, um, as in before React Server Components, you could server render a page, but then all the components in the page are still client components. But with Server Components, you can server render just like a single element, a card, a blog post, um, while the rest, maybe its parent could be a client, etc. So you could you can really include the server where and when you need. For example, if you have a bulky thing like a date formatter or a markdown for something like that, um, you could then turn that into a server component. Again, we'll look at practically how we do that in a minute. So that includes the server at every level of the DOM that unlocks tremendous benefits of which we'll explore. And finally, tremendous benefits for data fetching, performance, user experience, data fetching, performance, user experience. So that's the sentence. I'll say it one more time. React server components is an architecture built on next generation tooling that is still experimental and not production ready that requires rethinking React that includes the server at every level of virtual DOM unlocking tremendous benefits for data fetching, performance, and user experience, okay? Now, I, I've reached the point in the video where I, I kind of realized, okay, I, I am talking too much and I'm starting to get bored. So let's create something with React Server Components together, and then we'll talk about what we did and recap from there, okay? To do that, we're gonna go over to the computer. Um, I've got this application called um, my dog site and you can see there's a list of dog breeds i'm if you've if you've been part of the channel for any amount of time this shouldn't surprise you i i really like these dog breed apps um what we have is a rotating doggo here we have um a field for your name and we have server time okay i don't, I don't know why i just did that um, and indeed it, it navigates so when you click on briard you go see the briard um, this once again is just a client app so we're running npx vite um in case you're wondering and if we look at the source code, um, we'll understand how it works. But what I want to highlight here is the navigation. There is no client router. The navigation is fully like multi-page application style. So we're actually doing a full page reload every time. And you can tell by my state here being blown away. Tages. And if I change the page, it goes away. And also this thing, as I navigate, resets its animation. So if I click here, it jumps. You see that? It, 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 it doesn't keep going in a smooth circle. And that's kind of annoying. Okay, so let's look at the code now. So we have an index.tsx, and what we're doing here is we get the breed, uh, and we communicate breed over you know search params. So that's why we get the breed, and we hydrate the document with the layout, and we have a little basic router, meaning if the path matches list, we show list; otherwise, we show the detail page. Okay, and we pass in the breed. That's what's happening here. Let's look at our layout component. 
Our layout component is exactly what you'd expect. It's a layout. It has HTML, head, everything here. Um, it has our little doggo, has a title with a link back to the root, an input, and so on. A little date here. Okay. Um, let's go look at the list component. The list has some use state. So all of these are held in state, the breeds. Um, and the images you kind of see in the background are held in state. We fetch, let me just give you some more space here. We fetch the dog API's list um, and then we get it. And this is, this is the array. This is the array of breeds. But once we have the array of breeds, let me remove that. Um, once we have the array of breeds, we then also get an array of images per breed and we return both of them, breeds and images. And then we set them. Okay, it's a very long, very maybe inefficient way to do it, but here we are. And then we have some markup. So welcome to my dog site, P and ULs. Um, similarly, if we go into the detail page, um, what we'll see is, let's go to detail. It's similar. So we get the image, oh, that's adorable. Uh, we get the image and then set the image and so on. Okay, so there's of course some problems with this. Um, for example, we are fetching, um, only on the client side. Not only are we fetching only on the client side, we're rendering only on the client side. So if I come back um, here and view source, um, there's nothing, right? So we're fetching and rendering on the client side, and this isn't really ideal uh, for search engine optimization, etc. We, we talked about this in the previous video on Next.js and how, where we made a makeshift Next.js from scratch. I'll put a link um, at the top if you missed it. But step one, let's maybe add a server again. We're not going to do the whole, the whole deal. Um, but we do need to benefit from a little bit of server rendering. So let's start wet our toes a little bit by adding a server, and then we'll add server components to the server. Okay. So um, if you've been around for the last video to add a server, we have server.tsx. It's an empty file. We will import React from React. We'll import Express from Express. We'll import uh, render to string. We're using render to string just for simplicity. Um, you should be using something stream-based. And then we'll start our We'll start an application. So we'll say const app is express. And we'll listen to the public. We'll use the dist directory to get static assets. This is like things like CSS and images and stuff. Then we'll get on the root, but we'll call it path here. Um, and lastly, we'll listen on port 3000. And we'll say um, server is listening on port 3000. Fantastic. Okay. So now we need to dynamically load. We need path-based routing. And this is something, again, this is something we did in the last video on Next.js. Um, the link will be in the description. And I've put it up there a few times. Um, path-based routing. Let's go. So what we're going to do is we have two pages, detail and list. Um, and, and they come along the query param path. So we'll turn this into an async function. And what we'll do is we'll say on page is we'll do a dynamic import import and we'll join i need to import join don't i join uh, we'll join the current working directory with dist pages and the path just like that and then when we have it we'll say const component is the default export and we'll say the um we, yeah we can just say the html is we render the layout and the component and we'll res.end with the html this should give us what we want i think um, of course, we, we also can do props. So let's just wrap uh, props in the rec.query. Okay, save. So now we, we, we are server rendering a little bit, um, also with path-based stuff. Let's see what happens. So if we come here, um, we'll npm run build, if I can type. Um, we'll start that server, and it should start. And now let's go visit localhost 3000 slash list. Um, great, it works, um, but we're not fetching data, and that's because we don't have React on the client side. So we can easily fix that by adding maybe here script sources slash client. Okay, and we'll rebuild the server. Okay, cool, it works. We have server rendering, but once again, we have server rendering without data. Um, and notice the state is still blown away. So if I go here, yeah, it's not really good. Also, we have some server rendering, for example, we have RSC thingy and stuff, but we don't have the list of dog breeds, we don't have the data. So our server rendering is a bit of a waste. Okay. Now this is where in the last video, we did some Next.js stuff with get server side props. This is our opportunity to refactor this to use server components and turn our components into async components. Okay, so let's do that now. So if we go to um, 
list. Let's start with list. It would be great if we remove all this nonsense and just like turn it into a nice async component and fetch. So let's get rid of this and we'll say, you know, const breeds is we just want this up to here. That's it. And then we can say um, const images is this, right? And we can get rid of all of this noise. We need to close this bracket. Um, promise all breeds dot map. This looks good. I don't know why you're complaining. What? Uh, we we need to await. Nice. I love TypeScript. Okay. So look at that. We simply we simplified it a lot. And best of all, listen. Look look at me. Best of all, watch this. We can do this. We can. Amazing. Okay. So now we have an async component, and logically it should work. Let's try. This is, by the way, a server component. This is a server component, an async component that can do cool data fetching stuff that you trust because it's on the server. Okay. But let's see if it'll run. So we'll save this, go here, kill our server, restart our server and everything. And okay, we have a TypeScript issue because it doesn't know that components can be async. That's fine. We'll just say this is any for now. Not, not a big deal. Okay. Let's go back, reload. And a massive crash because look at the error objects are not valid as a react child found object promise what it needs is a react element so we need some way to turn objects and promises into what react recognizes as elements how do we do that well react has a special indicator on its elements dollar dollar type of and its value is a symbol for react element this is how it knows it's an element so we need to take this promise somehow await it turn it into a react element and send it to the client. This is what server components do. They send, they don't send, a lot of people say they send HTML to the client. They don't do that. They send React elements, literally JavaScript objects, React elements to the client, and then React on the client side can work with it. Okay, that's how server components work. You need to pay attention to that. Okay, so how do we go about this? How do we go about converting this promise and other things into React elements that we can then send over the wire, aka server components? Well, we need to start by transforming JSX into this tree okay so let's let's do that through some functions so if we come back to the code what we're going to need on the server side is some some type of function um, called like const turn jsx into client object okay and we get jsx and here we need to process this jsx somehow we need to handle it um and jsx can be many things what do i mean by jsx i mean this so it's an element here it's text here it could be a number, etc. So we need to basically just do a massive like if or switch and handle the different things JSX can be and process them. Okay, so let's do that. So what we're going to do is let's start simple. If it doesn't exist, we'll return null, which is a valid React element type uh, or a thing that React understands. If it's a string or a number or a Boolean um, dot includes type of JSX, then we just return it as it is. Great. If it's an object, if it's an array, good, thank you, Copilot. We'll return that. But we want this to be async because we want to await those things. So we'll just await promise.all instead. Okay, this is good. Next, um, if it's an object, now it gets interesting because all React elements are objects, but not all objects are React elements. So how can we make sure that this is not just an object, but an object that is a React element? We check the type of property. So if um, JSX dot dollar dollar typo equals the symbol for React dot element. Then we need to do some things. Now, a React element looks like this. So you have tag or type, uh, which is either a div, you have props, and you have children. Um, if this is if this is hard to grok. There's a video on YouTube of me teaching React from first principles it's called Deconstructing React. I'll put a link up there and under the like button. But this is basically what your JSX becomes. It becomes type props children. The thing is type could be a string if it's a built-in component like a div, or it could be someone else like someone else's React component like, like this, right? So you don't know what it is. And we need to account for both cases where type is a string and where type is a function. So we'll do that. So we'll say if jsx.type is a string, that's actually not how we do that. We do type of um, string. Then we do something. And also, if it's a function, we do something else. Function. Okay. So let's handle the string case first. If it's a string case, we just need to return 
whatever it is, but also work with its props. Specifically, we need to process its props because its props might be children. So we need to turn those also into um, a client object. So that's done. Now we handle the function case. Um, if it's a function, we, we get its JS, like all React components that are functions like this, return more JSX. So we need this stuff. We need the JSX. So we'll say const um, component is the type, is the function. And we have props, of course. This is jsx.props. We say const rendered thing is we just call component with props. Now keep in mind, components can be async, remember. So we'll, we'll await that. And what do we return? We return, we further recursively process those things. So um, rendered thing. And we're just like recursively processing all these things until they're objects. We're going all the way down. Okay, fantastic. Lastly, if we're just doing this on props and the props are not JSX, we need to handle that case as well. In this case, props are always an object. So if it's still an object, we'll come here and we'll say the keys. Well, we don't want keys, we want entries really. Um, we want entries and what we'll do is we'll say const um, processed entries is um, entries.map and we get here prop and value and we'll just return prop and await um, exactly and we'll process the value now we can't await because this is not async so we'll turn this into an async function turn this into an async function here but now this needs to be promise.old um, and it needs to be awaited okay and lastly we can return object no, from entry so we're just getting back an object again of processed entries this looks good so we have this thing that takes a bunch of JSX like this and turns it into a big react JavaScript object it's fully serialized except you know functions aren't serializable we'll, we maybe won't get to that in this video maybe the next one but we've serialized into a big object and now if we send that object from the server to the client then react can probably uh, render it and do its job let's try it. Uh, one thing to note is that client in the context of server components means anything that can consume the server components output that is the big jsx tree you know what else can consume the server components output outside of react on the client side react on the server side it can take this big jsx tree that we've made um, and turn it into html so let's do that. But first, let's see what we just did. So what I want to do is instead of render to string, let's say const client JSX is, and we'll await turn JSX into client object, and we'll just copy this into that instead. Okay, and we'll sure we'll render this to string. Um, but I want to also see. Let's just for fun show what we serialize. So we'll do this. And we'll run the server again. Hopefully it works. Good. And we'll go to port 3000. And what we'll see is, this is what we get. A big tree. Let's look at the raw data. So it's just a big thing where it's type HTML. It's just a bunch of React. Um, so yeah, it's just like a bunch of elements. So HTML has children, head, meta, etc. And then body. as So it's just you know a big thing with type, props, etc. It's just a big object. Okay. So anyway, let's come back here and take this object and render it to a string and then serve the client the string that this object becomes. So we'll kill the server again, restart it, and it's instantly replaced. Notice, it, and that's because we're using React on the client side. So if we get rid of this for now, um, we'll restart the server. And we should have, there we go. We have server rendered server components because the server consumes the, the RCs and gives you output. So this is great. We have working server components. Does it does it work on the sub page? It doesn't. Probably for the same reason. Um, we need to go and update breed uh, the, the detail page as well. So instead of all of this, we'll say equals await. Say image URL alone equals await fetch. This looks good. And instead of calling set image URL, we'll just return this. Perfect. And again, we can get rid of use effect, which is always nice. Okay, perfect. That's it. And this is async. And we need to tell TypeScript not to worry. Okay, let's do this again. So now the detail page is also server rendered with server components. And we can navigate. This is pretty nice. Um, so we have it, but we don't have React on the client side. And it kind of defeats the point of React. Because what React does is it helps you like 
persist state across things. It helps you have single page application like behavior. What I mean by that is this, um, have a look. So if we come here and we enter some state, my name is Tejas, this is also spinning. Um, if I navigate, I shouldn't lose that state. It should feel like a cohesive app experience. I think we can amplify this further by changing the background color. So we'll say the background color, if um, the rec params path is list is white, otherwise the background color is black, right? It should be a smooth transition. It shouldn't like just jump like a, like a legacy old website. So look, yuck, that's very abrupt. And also my state goes away. Um, not good. We can solve this using React on the client side. That's literally React on the client side's job. That's what we've used React for, for, you know, I was going to say millions of years, but for the last 10 years. So we need React on the client side. Um, how do we do that? Well, we already have this RSC output, the server component output that the server side understands. We just need to get the client side to understand it. Let's look at how we do that. So if we look at our client side app, we're calling hydrate root, and we're using the components here we need to use the RSC output here. So what we can do is we can fetch the RSC output, but that will introduce another network waterfall. Since we're already adding the, since we're already rendering the output here and including a script tag, let's include that script tag again. Um, what we can do is just inline the RSC output, literally, because we have it, right? So we'll say, um, we'll res.end with HTML, but we'll also add script and we'll, just like inline the RSC output. So we'll say window dot RSC output is, um, and we'll JSON dot stringify the client JSX. Look, done. Um, and while we're at it, we can also just like load React, um, just like this, save. Uh, did I change anything here? I don't think I did. Okay, save. Great, let's take a look. So we'll kill the server again, start it, reload and it died. It died really badly because my network died. That's interesting. I'm being rate limited. Let's try this again. Okay, cool. Dog.c was working, but our application crashes. And if we look at the console, um, lots of issues. Text content didn't match. Objects are not. So it's the same thing. We found object promise, etc. It's just not really doing its job. And that's because we're not swapping the output here. So we'll do window dot since we're adding it. Um, on the server side, window.rc output instead of the component we import. And we can get rid of all the imports here. We can uh, TS ignore this because we know it's there. Okay, so let's restart the server. Okay, so now we've gone from bad to worse, right? Because there's a lot failed to execute append child. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. There's just a lot of things going wrong. The reason for this is because what we're sending in the inline um, over the network isn't actually React elements anymore. Keep in mind, the identifier of something being a React element is the dollar dollar type of the symbol, but symbols don't go over the network when they're serialized. So in our JSON.stringify of this tree, we need to somehow swap out the symbol for something the client can understand such that the client brings back the symbol. This sounds a little bit weird. Let's just write code. I'm sure it'll make sense. So what we'll do is we go back to the server and instead of this json.stringify, um, we need a function called const sanitize json and it gets the key and a value from the json object and if the value is symbol for, this is the identifier of React elements, okay? Um, if it's that, notice we use that also here, right? So if it's a React element, we will return a new value, which is just the dollar sign. Otherwise we'll return, and this could be anything by the way, it doesn't matter. Otherwise we'll just return the value. Sanitize JSON, so we'll inline that instead. Similarly, on the client side now, we need to desanitize JSON or revive JSON. So we'll say revive JSON. Um, and if the value is the dollar sign, we just basically do the other thing, we swap it. Okay, and here we'll json.parse the RC output with the revive JSON function. Good. Um, the second argument here, we just like swaps out values for other values. Save that, restart the dev server. And now, there we go, we have it. We have React on the client side, we have server components working, but unfortunately we're still blowing away the state. Look at this state, and I click clumber, and it goes away. It's not ideal. The final thing we have to do 
is override link clicks and use our own navigation, client-side navigation, once client-side React takes over. And this will help persist the state and have a nice shared layout and give you a nice experience while also giving you multi-page application performance. It gives you single-page application user experience, okay? How do we do that? This isn't gonna take very long, let's go. So what we're gonna do, um, is we will add an event listener on the window. This is React also does this. They they wrap event listeners. Um, and what we want to do, let's just say this is any, uh, because I don't know what it is. And we'll say if e.target.tagName is not, if it's not an anchor link, then we don't do anything. Otherwise, we prevent default. We maybe push state. So we'll push this onto the history stack. Um, and we'll navigate to e.target.href. But of course, this function doesn't exist, so let's define it. Navigate. Uh, you may recognize this from Next.js or something too. But anyway, we'll navigate to, where do we navigate to? And what do we want to do? Well, what we, need, what we need to do now, whatever that is, we're not doing that. What we need to do now is fetch the JSX, the, the React tree uh, for the next page, and then re-render with that new output. Really, that's what we need to do. We need to fetch just the JSX tree and then re-render the page. We don't do a full navigation. So how do we do that? Well, in terms of pseudocode, we need to do const next page is await. So this is now async. Await fetch. Uh, we'll say two. And we'll maybe add a query param JSX. It's true. You know? um, and what we'll do is we'll get this as text. Okay, And then what we'll do with that text is we'll say... Um, json.parse the JSX using our revive JSX our revive JSON function. So now we have the next page and we just need to root. Keep in mind, we get the root from hydrate root. So root dot render the next page. That's it. Done. Fantastic. So everything's defined. Now we just need to add this to our server. So if we go to our server, we're already getting the JSON tree. So we'll say if rec.query.jsx is true, then we just return this, right? We just return the JSON string, that's it, okay? Uh, we don't even need to return it, we just send it and do that. Perfect, this looks good. Let's kill it, start it again, and reload. Okay, let's test. So now logically, if I type something, hello, this should persist between navigations. Indeed it does. Not only does it do that, the background color fades it smoothly transitions instead of a, an abrupt change. And the good doggo never loses its um, rotating status. It's always continuous. So we have server components and we have them working on the client side, on the server side. We implemented an IRC server to turn them into, this is how server components work. Uh, it takes a React JSX tree, turns it into an object, serializes it, sends it over the network, and then React picks it up on the client side and does what React does, which is make really nice updates. Um, that I hope was helpful. And with that, let's continue. So what we looked at was the interplay between React server components, client-side rendering, and server-side rendering. Client-side rendering, of course, is pretty bad because you need to first download the JavaScript bundle. It needs to parse, execute, run. Um, and then if you need data, it will go fetch data. It's just lots of waterfalls. It's not ideal. Also, you don't ship a lot of markup to your users or search engines. It's highly problematic. The solution then is server-side rendering. And indeed, that's what we did. Although when it came to data fetching, we server-side rendered some parts, but we had like holes where the data was, which is what led us to require React server components that fetches data nicely, turns it into a JSX tree, and feeds it into a client. A client can be a server that then sends a string to another client, or a client can be a browser. Client in the context of RFC means both things, okay? Um, let's talk lastly about how it actually works. Um, we, we saw how it works in that sense, but I think the value is being able to have any element, any level in the tree be async, so long as there's no interactivity there, and you can fetch data wherever you want. So then the question becomes, okay, so are server components better than client components? Like if I use client, should I feel bad? Absolutely not. Um, client components have their place, server components have their place, and it's really on us to weave them together well. In keeping with that, I think it makes sense to draw this boundary between server and client components really well using um, adoption principles. I think if we talk about how we can gradually adopt server components or how we can approach adopting server components, then we're in a better place to 
identify where client components fit in and where server components fit in. So with that, I'd like to give you three tools that you can use in, in moving towards server components. This will not help you go to server components overnight, but we'll put you in a good spot to adopt them once they're ready and stable. Okay. Um, number one is you want to fetch data early. You want to fetch data as early as possible before any state is set before we talked about it also in the next js uh, video again link under the like button you want to fetch data even at the server level like before and the earlier you fetch data the better your chances are of adopting server components number two is you don't want to reconsider your interaction boundaries um, what i mean by that is we usually have interactive pieces of our uh, react trees currently that are interleaved with non-interactive pieces uh, consider like an application like a blog post you have the title and you have a paragraph and you have a little button and I, from the most code bases i've seen um, all of these are within a card so you have card header content button and all of these are one file because it's relatively short um, the the problem there is that the interaction boundary is only at the button so the button in this case needs to be its own component. So you need, you need to have a card, a header, a title, and then a, a button not be part of this card component or the title and content, but be its own component. Meaning the onclick handler isn't a separate file, basically. And the reason for that is because onclick handlers cannot be serialized, therefore buttons cannot be server components. And so you'd, you'd put yourself in a good spot to adopt server components if your interactive things with handlers or functions or non-serializable props like onclick, et cetera, your interaction boundaries are in their own separate modules and those are as granular as possible. Number three, um, a lot of our applications use React context and context is great for literally that, for providing context to your application. For example, who is the logged in user? What are their preferences? Um, do they like, you know, the uh, toast? Then show them YouTube videos about toast. Even we use context sometimes for personalization. Um, on the server side, you don't get to use React context because that context is usually shared across multiple clients. And so the better alternative there is to use server side cache. Um, you could have a cache namespaced by user, for example. You could really do the same things or similar things that you used to do with context with server side cache, and then you get that as well. I think these three tools will help you um, really adopt server components, if not put yourself in a good position to adopt them once you feel like you can and once they are more mainstream. Um, and with that, I'd like to quickly um, come to the end of, of this video, but I wanted to address one thing before wrapping up. And that is, we talked about a lot of what React server components are, an architecture, a way to fetch data, etc. Um, I think one thing that RC is above and beyond all of that, is that React Server Components is a community effort. And by extension, React itself is a community effort. And I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention and acknowledge the fact that we haven't been the best community. The React community has had some issues lately with the discourse getting more and more hostile and ultimately leading even the most patient and kind of us, um, Dan Abramov and others, to burn out and not really enjoy being here. It feels like an obligation instead of a joy. Um, and that's pretty unfortunate for a community. And my hope is that in calling it out, it helps us take a moment to reflect and, and improve and really be the community that we want it to be and that it once was and that it, I believe it could be again. Um, with that, as usual, we covered a lot of content. I'm really thankful that you stuck around if you did. If you're enjoying and or benefiting and learning from these videos, um, please uh, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and drop a like. It would really help and it's just a great easy way to support me. Um, also, if you found the content useful, I'd encourage you to share it on social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, Blue Sky, um, whatever you, you like, and really spread it um, so that people can understand React server components and learn, and also um, that I would feel supported and be more likely to make great content, ideally, hopefully, great content like this. Um, all of this stuff is going to be in a GitHub repository that you can access as well. I'll put a link under the like button. And I want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Thank you for your interest in web technology and computer science. And I'll catch you in the next one. Peace.